Very commonly, founder equity is the primary compensation for a founding team early in a company's history. So how does that work? That's the topic of today's video. Hi, I'm Steve Morris, and I use this Startup SOS channel to provide practical how-to advice for new entrepreneurs who are building a growth company and plan to use investor funding. So in this video, we'll talk about what is founder's equity, what are the actual mechanics of getting founder's equity, and what happens if a founder leaves early? Do they get to keep all that stock or not? What exactly is founder equity? Founder equity is simply ownership in the company. Typically, early on uh, in a startup, uh, the company gets divided up amongst a founding team, whether it's one founder or, or multiple founders, and the founders end up owning 100% of the company typically. Now, not necessarily. They can always set aside some portion of it maybe for future uh, founders, future co-founders, or, or even potentially for uh, an option pool or even allocating some upfront some shares for investors that might uh, be down the road. But typically, you'll simply divide up the entire company amongst the founding team. And later, when you need more shares, you issue more shares, and that equally dilutes everyone in their ownership level. The way I think of founder equity is it's a trade. On the one hand, the founders are all saying, I'm going to work really hard to create value in this company. And as I do that, I'm creating intellectual property, and I'm going to assign all of that intellectual property to the company. Now, in return for that, I get ownership of some substantial part of the company so that I get to participate in the benefit of creating that value. So again, end of the day, it's all about ownership uh, in the company to uh, participate in the value, but it's in return for all that work you're going to do and all that intellectual property that you're going to develop that's going to be owned by the company. So how does that work for an LLC versus a C-Corp? Well, for either type of entity, you can certainly create a mechanism for ownership. Uh, if it's an LLC, your operating agreement can certainly define units, so those can be divvied up amongst the founding team. Likewise, if it's a C-Corp, then it's got a stock structure, and the stock can be divided up amongst a founding team. So either way works pretty similarly. And in either case, you can have actually different classes of ownership. Uh, it doesn't have to be a standard unit or just common stock. There could be some founders with more, more say, voting rights than other founders. You can certainly have different classes of stock, even for a founding team. Now, I think it's more common to have just a single type, just standard common stock or standard units in an LLC. But it can get more complicated than that. So depending on your particular goals and your particular situation, you know, maybe you create multiple classes of founder stock. But I think it's more common to have just one type, either common stock or, or standard units in an LLC. Once you have your legal entity and either units or stock, how does it work that you actually get those to the founders? How do they become owners? Well, could do it one of two ways, right? The company could simply gift some number of shares, uh, some number of shares of stock or units to the founding team, or you could buy it. And either way can work. The trick is if the company gifts the, uh, the, the stock or the units to the founding team, then the IRS looks at that as being a taxable transaction. They'll want to know what's the value of uh, those units or those shares. And, and that, again, is something they want you to pay tax on as a gift. And you can certainly do it that way. You can certainly uh, gift uh, the units or the shares and have people write uh, a tax check uh, to the IRS for it. And early on, the idea is the shares aren't worth that much, so the tax wouldn't be that much. So that is certainly one way to do it. I think the more common way to do it, though, is to have founders actually buy their shares up front. Again, early on, your company is not worth much. Uh, and so it's it's a fairly small check, but you're actually writing a check to buy those shares at fair market value specifically to try to avoid uh, tax issues with the IRS. Now that does bring up the question, okay, what's fair market value for a very early stage, maybe literally at the idea stage type company? Well, 
it's going to be very low if it's very, very early. And in this case, having a very low valuation is a good thing because that means the founders have to write just pretty small checks to buy their shares. Now, how small is small? It, you know, it, it, I mean, it's probably measured for the whole company in just a few thousand dollars so that each founder's check is going to be pretty small. But this is a good question to ask your emerging business attorney, someone who is familiar with the, uh, the with startup related law, SEC rules, etc., and who can give you a good idea of what's realistic, what what won't cause the IRS uh, any heartburn in terms of evaluation for a very early stage company. So get some advice, get a number that's not going to cause you problems, and uh, then you'll have a valuation. Then depending on how you divide up the shares amongst the, uh, the different founders, uh, that will determine how much of a check everybody gets to write. Now that leaves aside the question of how exactly do you decide how many shares or how many units for each founder? That's a topic unto itself that we're going to address in a separate video. One other topic we do want to cover in terms of just the mechanics of how this works is to address the question of what happens if a co-founder leaves relatively early. Let's say they've gotten a lot of stock, a significant uh, portion of the company, and they leave after just a few weeks or a few months, or even just after a year or two for that matter. What happens to that stock? Well, in general, it's not fair uh, for uh, a founder, a co-founder to leave fairly early and take all of their founders' shares with them because the idea was those founders' shares were going to represent their contribution to toward making the company valuable. And if they leave relatively early, they're not making good on that promise. So they really haven't earned all of that stock. So it's very, very common in founder shares to have some concept of vesting so that over time, in some way, founders sort of earn the right to keep the amount of stock that uh, that was agreed to that they would get up front. Now, that vest can work all kinds of ways. It could be a monthly vest. It could be an annual vest. Uh, four years is a common time frame for founder stock vesting, but it doesn't have to be four years. It could be three, it could be five, it could be really any number. Uh, sometimes you'll see cliff type vesting where maybe you'll have to be uh, at the company for an entire year before you have a right to keep any founder's share. But then after one year, if you leave, okay, maybe you get to, to keep, say, 25% of your shares, assuming it was a, a linear vest over four years. So there are all kinds of ways to do vesting. Uh, there really is no one standard way, but, um, but it's very common, certainly, to look at something like a four-year period for a startup to vest your shares. But how do you actually implement that kind of vesting? Uh, do you simply say, okay, you're going to get 30% of the company, uh, but you're going to have to work for a year, be with the company for a year, and, and then we'll give you a quarter of, of that 30%. And then after another year, uh, you work more, and then we'll give you an, another quarter. Uh, well, the problem with that approach is if you agree, say as a founder, I get 30%, but I don't actually get the shares until a year from now, and then I have to uh, to write a check. Well, a year from now, those shares are going to be worth a lot more, and I'm going to have to write a big check. That's not a very a attractive way to do it. So a much more common way to do it is an approach called the declining buyback right, where I actually write a check today for all of the shares I have coming. Let's say I'm, I'm going to get 30% of the company, and so that's translated into a particular number of shares. Um, and by the way, talking number of shares as opposed to percent of the company is important because a particular number of shares over time will be less and less of a percent of the company. So let's say it's agreed that uh, early on I'm going to get 30% of the company, and that is 100,000 shares. Great. So my documentation says 100,000 shares. Here's the price, which hopefully is very low. I write the check. I own all of those shares right up front. And that means I own all those shares. I can vote them whenever there's a shareholder vote. And so life is nice and clean and simple. However, the idea with the declining buyback right is that the company has the right to buy back 
some or even all of those shares if I leave the company too early. And that doesn't matter whether I leave because I want to leave, because I get a better offer, or because I'm asked to leave, I'm, I'm fired. Either way, for whatever reason, if I leave the company fairly early and I'm not adding to the value of the company, I get to, to forfeit some of that stock by, by way of the company buying it back. Uh, now, how exactly that works can, can vary greatly. Let's say it's a, a four-year vest with a one-year cliff. Well, then if I leave the company before a year is up, the company might have the right to buy back all of my shares 100%. And if I stayed less than a year, I'm, I'm out of there and I have no stock uh, at all. And I'm not getting a huge value for that uh, stock that I'm forfeiting. I'm getting paid probably what I paid for it, uh, not some arbitrary uh, increased value when I left, which would be a, a little bit later down the road, because who knows what that value is. I mean, valuing a really early stage company is notoriously difficult. So the objective thing to do is to say, no, I'm going to get paid what I bought it for. And, and that's reasonable given the intent, because the intent is I'm forfeiting that stock. I'm not getting paid value for it. I'm forfeiting it. Now, let's stay, say I, uh, in the case of a one-year cliff, I stay a year and a day. Well, then the company no longer has the right to back, buy back all my stock. They only have the right to buy back three quarters of it. The buyback right declined to three quarters. So I still forfeit three quarters of my stock after a year and a day, but at least I retain 25% of it. If I stay there for half a year uh, plus, say, a day, and then I leave, well, then the company's uh, right has declined to buying back just 50%. So they do that, and I walk away with half my shares. And then finally, if a full four years goes by and then I leave, the company's buyback right has completely expired. It's completely uh, declined to zero, and I get to keep all of my shares. So that's the idea behind uh, this kind of vesting, the declining buyback right. Again, a very common approach because it has these benefits of, of allowing me to buy my shares up front and to own them, to vote them, and I get to keep all of them as long as I stay with the company through the vesting period. So as you can imagine, there are some really important legal documents that need to be signed to document everything we just talked about. And I can't overemphasize how important this is to get it written down and signed and to get an attorney to help in doing that so it all gets done properly. You do not want to leave stock ownership and IP assignment until later. You want to do that really early on. If you leave it verbal and wait till later, there are going to be misunderstandings and that's not a good thing. So do this early on work with an attorney, uh, you'll need some kind of an equity purchasing agreement that documents how much you're buying, what you're paying, and so forth. I would strongly suggest you wrap into that a vesting of some sort, whatever your attorney recommends, but a, a declining buyback right is a, certainly a very common one. You need to have an intellectual property assignment agreement either wrapped into the uh, purchase agreement or an associated agreement that gets signed at the same time. But the company really does need to own the intellectual property developed by the, uh, the founders. And finally, one last uh, very important document is an 83B election that each founder needs to sign within 30 days of purchasing their equity in the startup. This is so important for tax reasons that I'm going to devote a short but an entire video to this topic. That'll be the very next one in this series. So I hope that took a little bit of the mystery out of the whole question of founder equity and how it works. If this was helpful, please click the like, share it, leave a comment if you have any questions or inputs. And if you haven't subscribed yet, please do that and hit that notification bell. Because as I said, there are more videos coming up in this series you won't want to miss. And of course, we'll have the series documented in the playlist. And there's a link to that right here. That's a wrap for this time. Thank you very much for watching.